We are going to get started. Welcome, everyone. I am Daniela Bleichmer. I am a professor of art history and history at USC and the director of the Levan Institute for the Humanities. Thank you so much for joining us today for a conversation about John Carlos Rowe's uh, recent publication, his latest book, Our Henry James in Fiction, Film and Popular Culture, published by Routledge in 2022. We do invite everybody who is here to turn on their camera if uh, that uh, works on their end. It's always nicer to see um, actual humans rather than names or stills. Uh, joining us today to discuss John's book are Beverly Haviland, senior lecturer and visiting associate professor of American studies at Brown University, and David McQuirter, Professor Emeritus of English at Texas A&M. And the conversation today will be moderated by Melissa daniels Roterkus, who is Associate Professor of English at USC. We will begin with comments by John for about five minutes, and then Beverly and David will engage John in conversation for roughly half an hour. And after that, we will open the floor for uh, questions uh, from uh, all the participants. At that point, uh, Melissa will let you know that we're ready for questions and we will ask you to please raise your uh, Zoom hand to let us know you have a question. Um, my thanks to the USC Department of English, who is the co-organizer of today's uh, book chat. And so first and foremost, many congratulations, John, on your new book. And please tell us about it. Thank you so much, Daniela and uh, Zach Mann, as well as to my dear friends, Beverly and uh, David, uh, and to their partners, uh, Marianne and Paul, who's on the uh, call here. We go way, way back, and I see so many friends that I've known for a long time. Lee, Sheila, I was writing down names here. Gene McGarry, Dennis Foster, just unbelievable. This is like a reunion. So I won't belabor it. I only have five minutes. Uh, and uh, thank you, Melissa, for moderating this. Melissa and I are not only colleagues, but dear friends from our uh, battles in the English department and Dornsife. Uh, <laughs> we have many anecdotes to tell. But this is about my book. And as we ask our PhD, our dissertation students, so uh, when they begin their dissertation, what's your research question? Formulate your research question, please. My research question is just fairly obvious. Why is James so popular in other media uh, as well as in literature, which we would expect from the 1990s onward? It does seem kind of baffling uh, we, so many of us on this call today, love Henry James, but uh, he's a difficult writer. He's not taught that frequently in college and university any longer. He's a kind of token canonical figure. You better teach him in the intro to American literature or something like that. But uh, who would have expected he would have entered popular culture as he has, uh, represented in so many films and uh, other media? So. I tried to answer that question, and the answer that I give in this book is it's really his ambiguity uh, about certain crucial social, political, and human issues in his own period, some of which he played with, as we know famously in Turn of the Screw, but a number of which uh, ambiguities, especially concluding ambiguities in his famous long winded novels. You remember William James. His brother gave him a book plate which showed a man beating a dead horse, uh, which is maybe the most expressive of all about you. Or William James also notoriously said, just say it, Henry. Uh, he does go on a bit. So uh, there's that problem of ambiguity that seems to not really relate to popular culture, which certainly in our generation is short sweet and to the point. So how do these two things uh, connect? Uh, one of the things that I say in the book is that James's uh, use of popular culture, which has been noticed by many scholars, many on the screen here have written about this, 
But I really say that they generally say that James borrowed from popular culture, but he rendered it as high culture. And that makes a lot of sense when you think of how complicated he is. Uh, but in my uh, treatment in this book, I say he is much more indebted to and much more a phenomenon of pop popular culture than we have ever recognized. And I try to make that somewhat counterintuitive case uh, in this book and a variety of chapters. Uh, I asked you to read chapters six and eight, the one on Peter Bogdanovich uh, and on James's influence on literature, because I think the Bogdanovich chapter gives a pretty good uh, account of how I understand James having a role in contemporary popular culture, that is our popular culture uh, today. I mean, I'm going back to Daisy Muller in, 19, in the 1970s. But there's the gist of the book, and I hope that it's, it's uh, provocative. I really hope in writing books to provoke my fellow scholars to respond and to be argumentative and to come up with other ideas. Uh, I'm not looking for disciples, certainly at my age, uh, <laughs> who needs or wants disciples? I want people to do other things. So there is the five minute summary of the book. Let me check my watch and make sure I probably like all professors gone over, but that's five minutes. So I'm gonna be quiet now and listen to what my dear friends have to say. I of course invited dear friends because I'm expecting them to not give me too hard a time. Uh, <laughs> And uh, to the rest of you who are on the screen, also so many good friends, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about this new book. So thank you so much. So um, we decided that I would be the first one to uh, speak and I have so many things I want to um, ask you about and talk about. And I really enjoyed reading the book, John. Um, and it also gave me the excuse to both read uh, Daisy Miller again, which I have not done for many decades. And um, I forced yes. my uh, uh, beloved partner and spouse to watch the movie uh, with me. Um, but I have to admit that my view of Daisy Miller was highly influenced um, by having recently seen Barbie. And um, <laughs> When I talked last week with my class about what the idea of the American girl was for them, you know, in trying to see whether Barbie um, registered as sort of the the quintessential American girl the way that Daisy Miller had for so many readers in James's era, um, I was really surprised by some of the responses that that she she didn't seem. Um, in fact, one um, uh, one student actually said about about Sybil Shepherd. I thought, well, doesn't she seem like a Barbie kind of all American, you know, quintessential girl? Said no, she seemed more European to me. And I went like, whoa, okay. But then I found out this this young lady was Brazilian. So you know, <laughs> one of the things that was really interesting was you know a different reading of what it meant to be American. And I think she was seeing you know, both Barbie and Daisy Miller as more like Northern European blondes who are not necessarily the dominant um, American girl uh, these days, right? You know, with the changes in our, our um, national population. So, I mean, I think that question is sort of related to the work that you're doing in the, the last chapter, although I would like to talk more about the, the Bogdanovich movie with you and and really a, a point you make about how i think um i did in fact mark it it is on page 191 where you say uh but intellectually ozick's novel identifies the historical point at which james's cosmopolitanism failed to achieve a genuinely global vision and i thought that was a very provocative uh comment and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about you know exactly how you think that failure happened and whether there was the possibility at that time for that kind of globalism to have been accessible to a writer that was a long question sorry 
No, that's great, Beverly. Thank you. And uh, I, I love the connection with Barbie, although I'm uh, fascinated uh, also about a little bit uh, uh, befuddled that uh, the students didn't make the connection because that seemed to me a really obvious and good one uh, that uh, the Barbie film, I won't say anything about the dolls since I, <laughs> I never played with them and I didn't have any daughters, but that uh, the film, which obviously has received so much acclaim for, you know, it's uh, transvaluing of the sexism of the Barbie doll to the feminism of the protagonist in the, in the film, uh, you know, it's like a wonderful way to get back to Daisy Miller, but Obviously, the American girl type of Daisy Miller in the Bogdanovich film uh, is uh, out of date. You know, it doesn't play any longer, maybe for the reasons I suggest in the book of the structural sexism that Bogdanovich is uh, channeling through that. What has always struck me as a really weird film. So the option would be to go back and see what students might think about reading Daisy Miller, which they they don't care for, by the way, <laughs> but to go back and read Daisy Miller in conjunction with watching uh, watching the Barbie film, uh, that would be that would be kind of interesting. Yeah, um, I actually had them read. I had them read it as well as see the film. Just FYI. Oh, you did. Yeah, you did yeah. have them. I I didn't uh, pick pick up on that. And did they find the the uh, uh, novella to be dated and to be kind of boring or? No, I think they I think they found the novella to be um, quite interesting and, uh, you know, sort of digging into it and trying to um, explain the point that you make actually in the first chapter where you're talking about the effect of, of romanticism on Daisy Miller, you know, and sort of seeing how how um, James is, you know, very subtle devices are uh, producing effects, you know, I mean, that's really what I was trying to get them to to start to get a sense of is how how the writing produces that uncertainty, not just the representation. So, yeah, yeah, oh, they like good. that. I guess I yeah. I missed that part in yeah. your comments, and that's yeah. my fault. But the uh, it's wonderful to know that uh, the complexity that of the Daisy Miller character in James's novella is still present to them, especially if you layer it and you know kind of explicate all of this romantic background I was taught the novella you know my professors I, either they didn't know or they didn't want to bother to lay out there so i i dug in a lot and i tried to show how daisy was very complicated as a as a figure in the novella uh, thanks in part to her affiliation with byron and shelley and keats and all the other romantic figures less with mary shelley which uh, james could have done but he he kind of uh, gives her a kind of transgender identity in the novella, which I think is quite uh, contemporary. But of course, as I argue in that chapter, he then takes it away at the end by saying, you know, she dies, it's her fault. And the real interest here is in what I've done as the author. And I try to make a big claim for that in uh, chapter one, uh, which I didn't ask you all to read. But in chapter one, I call this the formalization of sentiment that James and other male participants in the sentimental tradition tended to do in order to distance themselves from what Hawthorne called the mad tribe of scribbling women who so uh, successfully competed against those male writers and sold many more books. So uh, in the formalization of sentiment, I'm really kind of arguing that James displaces a potentially exciting feminine and feminist protagonist, and he displaces her with himself. I'm the great art artist. I achieved the, uh, I made the achievements that this poor woman never will achieve because she died, died young and was naive, finally. Back to the question about Ozick, and I'm going on a bit too long, but uh, I think where James's cosmopolitanism failed, and Ozick identifies it in her novel, uh, a, a somewhat formulaic novel, if you ask me, uh, Foreign Bodies, which many people probably didn't read when it came out, but Jamesians read because Oz Ozick is a distinguished James scholar and distinguished novelist in her own right. 
But she rightly identifies that James's cosmopolitanism, which we now look back to as a kind of distant uh, modernist phenomenon of the cultivated gentleman, stress uh, gentleman, was displaced when cosmopolitanism had to face traumas like World War I, and then of course the Holocaust, World War II, and the great traumas we still live with today. And Ozick says, you know, James never really adequately engaged those issues, which were incipient in his own age. You know, they were there. The traumas of colonialism, of racism, globalization, and the rest. We can debate that, but I think that Ozick rightly identifies a limitation in uh, James's cosmopolitanism and globalism. And I'll stop there. Um, so, uh, John, I want to say of your, your two cruxes here, I think you're completely right about James and popular culture. I think we lose a lot by not making those connections and we gain almost nothing by keeping them separate. Um, uh, you know, by keeping high literature from uh, apart from popular culture, I just don't, I, I don't buy it about James and I, you know, uh, I haven't for a long time. So, um, um, but I wanted to ask about the other crux, which is the, uh, ambiguity. Um, and, um, I have a question. I'll come back. My second question is really more specifically about Baldwin and James, but this, this is a kind of broad, a broad question. Um, and, you know, ambiguity is a big term, right? And you use it to include things like James's sort of inconclusive conclusions um, or uh, um, his uh, um, a certain kind of relation to the reader that he develops and so forth, right? Um, so you're using it in a pretty capacious um, sense. Um, I'm, but I, I'm actually more interested in your own ambivalence about <laughs> his ambiguity, if you will, right? Which is to say, I, I jotted down words that you associate with with Jamesian ambiguity: indecisive, playing with issues rather than really seeking to change anything, um, hiding. Uh, deferring, right? Um, avoiding, right? Um, um, sublimating, um, neglecting, right? Um, mm. Perhaps the strongest of the negative ones is refusal, right? You know, James, sometimes you say James refuses to engage a certain issue, right? But you also describe his ambiguity. Um, as a strategy, right? And so I'm really curious about, you know, having played with a lot of different ways of reading um, uh, that quality in James, where you might have uh, ended up here, or, you know, maybe ending is the wrong word, but <laughs> where has it left you in terms of thinking about uh, about, uh, you know, a, a broad description of James's literary strategies. Well, thanks for that, David. Uh, it, it's in a in a sense, uh, kind of a confessional because I started my career as a deconstructive critic of James. And uh, I was part of a group, uh, several of whom are here, uh, who were active in identifying James's strategy of uh, uh, ambiguity. Uh, and, uh, you know, it goes way back to previous uh, 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 non-deconstructive critics, the famous piece about, uh, you know, by Edmund Wilson, The Ambiguity mm -hmm. of Henry James, which was very influential on Turn of the Screw. And uh, so, uh, you know, we were uh, in the 70s and the 80s very aggressive in arguing James always knows exactly what he's doing. You know, <laughs> this was the genius argument. Uh, if he's uh, ambiguous, he's saying to the reader, you know, the standard cliche was find out for yourself. And that means, as a great modernist, James was forcing the responsibility onto the reader. And the reader often betrayed himself, herself, their self as uh, foolish or sexist or racist or brilliantly insightful, like Henry James himself, in the particular reading that he gave. 
Mm -hmm. We did a lot of that. You know, we read a lot of his works, notably Turn of the Screw in that way. But I think going back and looking at some of the crucial and the famous moments, take Turn of the Screw because it's the one in which he's the most strategically ambiguous. But James dodges the questions of gender and sexuality, right? In the ways in which Jack Clayton's film does not. And when I really, I had never written on Jack Clayton's film, but I, I had, uh, you know, I realized that uh, Capote was the second script writer. And he puts things into the script, which uh, notably Miles telling the governess at one point, it's because I'm different that uh, James was not uh, courageous enough to address. I mean, he was not a gay writer. He was a closeted homosexual writer. And so he could not engage this problem. He, you know, in the famous readings of the man with the red ha uh, hair on the tower, you know, the uh, kind of suggestions that this might be Oscar Wilde, he is kind of demonizing uh, you know, he is kind of demonizing homosexuality in terms of how people responded in that contemporary moment, also to Wilde, uh, to mm -hmm. Wilde himself, whom he envied, didn't like. You know, we know all these stories about Turn of the Screw. So you have the radical uh, ambiguity, which long ago Edmund Wilson said was, in fact, a strategy. He wasn't a deconstructive critic, but that he... Uh, you know, that James employed, but even within that ambiguity, James is dodging certain crucial issues. Uh, and I think you see that in a lot of his other writings. And I'm saying I myself as a deconstructive critic of the 80s, probably well into the 90s, uh, I didn't want to see that. It didn't. <laughs> and I think there were other, let's call them post-structuralist or post-modern critics of James who also didn't want to see it. They didn't want to see that James was like, hey, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do with uh, progressive women. I don't know what to do with Henrietta Stackpole in a uh, you know, portrait of a lady. I think I'll marry her off at the end because it doesn't really solve the problem. It just makes her look foolish or contradictory. So a lot of that, I think I went back and reevaluated as I was writing this book. <laughs> Well, um, what a what a fabulous and, and rich discussion. Um, thank you so much, John, and, and thank you to Beverly and to David. Um, uh, Beverly and David, I want to first, uh, before I kind of open the floor to questions from the audience, um, would you guys like to ask John any follow-up questions or just make general comments? Um. I have lots of questions, but if I, I, I think maybe I can link to what you were just talking about, about ambiguity, and ask you to um, say something more, John, um, about, you know, ambiguity in the kind of national and um, uh, context or the context of national identity. And I'll tell you, I actually have a very self-interested reason for asking this. I'm deep in trying to work through the writings in um, within the rim as part of the uh, edition of Sense of the Past. Um, and and James's vacillation in his national identifications over the course of writing those late essays, you know, and while he's really He's involved. I mean, I understand what you're saying, you know, in terms of him not engaging with uh, probably most evidently, um, you know, sexism and imperialism, you know, that were mm -hmm. uh, very evident um, uh, in his time. But I, you know, his own um, uh, response to the war and the the kind of troubled uh, relationship he had, you know, with his own American nationality at that point, you know, was very different, I think, from the kind of cultural critique he was engaged in um, earlier, you know, that it really became political in a way that perhaps he was not um, anticipating. This is not to say that those essays in which he's 
he's vacillating between you know uh, his american identifications english identifications wanting to say nice things about france and the belgians he keeps struggling to say something nice about the belgians right <laughs> yeah. um you know but but the kind of, of fluidity of national identification that he's undergoing there is, I think, um, you know, seeing something not evasive in the the uncertainty. Um, and I did, I actually went back and read your essay on Turn of the Screw uh, in preparation mm -hmm. for this. So I, I you know, the, the, the deconstruction of John, you know, is uh, very much present there. Um, in that essay, but do you see do you see in the the ambiguity the question of the ambiguity also playing a role in the um, questions we were talking about before about the the uh, failure of cosmopolitanism? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in in a strange way, those weird essays in Within the Rim, and I'm happy to hear you're working on them because a couple of years ago I went back to them and wrote something about them, and I thought, wow, you know. What's going on here? There's a lot of uh, uh, odd uh, stuff going on as he's giving up his American citizenship. He thinks he's doing this strategically as a famous person to call attention to the importance of the British war effort in World War One, and to say to you know the uh, American uh, public as well as to say to Wilson that you know you should get into this war because the the Germans are really brutalizing. Uh, you know, the uh, British and, and the Belgians and the French, and uh, you owe it uh, to uh, Europe to uh, support them. In that regard, he's pretty straightforward. But on the other hand, in his typical, well, I'm not really a British, even though I'm becoming a British citizen, and uh, I'm not really, you know, a, uh, a native to this country, there's a lot of waffling going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, his his own uh, official position, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, uh, head of the, uh, you know, ambulance corps and having some contact with refugees of the war and feeling guilty. So there's this kind of waffling. Here I am, this guy, I didn't, I didn't go to the Civil War for whatever mysterious, you know, medical condition I had. Uh, and I, now I'm not, I'm too old to go into World War One, but I'm doing what I can. But there's guilt and anxiety. I'm not a refugee. I'm a reasonably wealthy, upper middle class guy living here in England in my fancy house in, in Rye. So there's that kind of uh, ambivalence there that puts a kind of crack in the superiority of the cosmopolitan who knows multiple languages, who can speak fluently about different art forms and can incorporate them into complex novels and so forth and so on. That's maybe an anticipation of what Ozick is talking about in Foreign Bodies, although in her rewriting of James's international theme, she's very critical of James, you know, her uh, predecessor, where she kind of started writing about James uh, when she was a scholar in her dissertation and other, other writings. So there is that ambivalence in James at that moment. But I wanna emphasize another ambivalence that is part of what David said a moment ago about the refusal, the repression really in James. And that's the changing race relations in the late 19th, early 20th century. And the fact that, you know, we could say World War I is in a sense a, a war that's produced by colonial conflict that eventually comes back to haunt uh, Europe. One reason I took the very strange path in chapter eight of writing about Baldwin's Another Country, as if Baldwin had written it after all these writers who were obviously influenced by James, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, and the famous one, the great Irish uh, novelist, Colm Tobin, who writes The Master about James. So, so I wanted to stress the fact that uh, no matter how we kind of uh, patch together a later Henry James, who inspires and influences us, he really missed the boat on a number of important issues. And Baldwin calls him, calls him to account, I think, in another country. Unfortunately, a novel that didn't get the sort of reputation it deserved in 1962 when it came out, but because uh, Baldwin is basically saying, 
you missed the whole connection between sexuality and race that is so crucial to, let's say, human beings, to the universal, but certainly Americans missed. They don't understand that the racial dynamic and the sexual dynamic, especially as it leads to the discrimination against minorities in the United States, including uh, gay people, uh, you know, you missed the boat, Henry. And instead of writing a long diatribe as Ozick does, you know, kind of beating up on James, uh, Baldwin doesn't do that. He just writes another novel. And the other novel is, I think, a brilliant repost to Henry James. And, you know, I, I have to say, although I read the novel a long time ago, I think when I was in graduate school, another country, I never got it. I just, it, it didn't, you know, it was just kind of, you had to hit me with a two by four to wake me up and see. It's a rewriting of the of James's novel of manners, but in the wacky, you know, sexually and uh, racially complex New York City of uh, the post-World War II period. And so I think that's uh, another point where James's cosmopolitanism, you know, we can beat up on him for having a tall silk hat for, you know, the woman uh, attacking the painter, painting of him by John Singer Sargent, not knowing it was James, but thinking it was a banker and, you know, carving it up with a kitchen knife. Uh, the truth of the matter is that James's cosmopolitanism was fairly capacious of diversity, but not of racial and sexual diversity. And I think that was a huge, you know, miss on his part. He should have said, hey, I'm not, you know, I know it was really dangerous to be a closeted, you know, a gay man in that period. But uh, maybe Oscar Wilde speaking out was was better, you know. I don't know. That's a hard hard one to uh, you know uh, hard one to conclude or judge in retrospect. But that's that's my take on the problem of his cosmopolitanism leading into World War One as World War One begins. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful explanation, John. Um, D David, would you like to maybe ask um, one more question from John before we... I, I would, and um, it, it's about another country. Um, I, I enjoyed reading your book, John, and it provoked me to reread another country for the first time in like 30 years, a, a really wonderful novel. Um, but at the risk of exposing myself as a died in the world deconstructionist, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I was struck by all the moments that you pointed to as directly Baldwin, directly referencing James. They all have something in common, right? They're, they are all uh, they all relate to the inability to say something. Mm. The um, the epigraph, right? Uh, the Americans, right? Uh, they are, can give no account of themselves in any terms already consecrated by uh, human use. Uh, when talks about the you know the native son and wings of the dove being on the coffee table or the bedside table, or whatever. The, the very next page, right? Uh, Eric thinks it, it, it is feeling terror, and he says, "And what were these terrors? They were buried beneath the impossible language of the time, right?" Um, and uh, there's uh, an, uh, the other one that you mentioned when uh, Rivaldo, right, is sort of thinking about Balzac and Henry James and James Joyce and Faulkner or whatever. And it's kind of the same thing, right? What are the terms, right? How can I find some terms? And to me, this is very Jamesian, right? This is where I kind of want to back Henry up a little bit here, right? You know, because it does seem to me that James is so aware, right? And you say it yourself, actually, page 216 and late James Right, late James is innovative in recognizing the social restrictions on what can be thought and imagined, and I think that's a very key key thing in my in my James. Right, that is he's always sort of pushing, right, to try and find a way around those restrictions. Right, maybe it's a strategy. I don't know, but um, but uh, one of the very first scholarly articles on James, eighteen ninety nine, Cornelia Pratt. 
she said, she said in his more recent work, which would have been late 90s, 1890s, he was exercising his dexterity on the problem of saying the unsayable, right? Yeah. And I, I'm just, it seems to me that your reading, your wonderful reading of another country sort of picks up on that very much, that Baldwin under, gets that about James, right? Yeah. And it's translating it into a different set of unsayables, right? Perhaps, or an extension of the unsayables of James's own own times. So I, I, you know, I just wondered about that because it was really a through line in your reading of another country. Now, I think that's a, a very fair uh, observation and a very uh, sophisticated observation, David, about how Baldwin is uh, borrowing from James but borrowing from James in a really remarkable way that we don't usually associate with, you know, the, uh, the, the acolyte, uh, you know, borrowing from the great master and saying, well, I'm trying to aspire to what you're doing here. If I could only just get it right, Shakespeare, you know, I, I would be a famous playwright or Joyce or, or Henry James. And what you suggest is that, uh, Baldwin picks up from James the struggle to speak through a kind of incredibly opaque and very, very difficult language, uh, topics that are otherwise uh, unaddressable, unrepresentable. I mean, there's old term from the post-structuralist days, the unrepresentable. My colleague at Irvine, Leotard, was great on that topic. Uh, it's also a terrific dodge, which we used a lot. You know, if it's unrepresentable, you can't say anything about it. But I mean, uh, James was wonderful at doing that. And I think uh, certainly Baldwin learns that from him. He shows him enormous respect without, you know, beating him, beating him about, about the head for his limitations and failings and just says, well, if, if you want to do something different, address you know, different social and political issues that the other guy missed, don't tell him, especially if he's dead, you miss them, just go about and do it. Go ahead and do it. And I think that's what Baldwin does by paying great respect to novels like The Wings of the Dove, which is the weirdest one in the world to have sitting on somebody's bedside table along with uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the guide to acting that he's also reading because he's going to go back and you know, have a part in a Broadway play and then at a film later on, he thinks when he comes back to the U.S. So it's really quite, quite amazing kind of respect. Yeah. Not to mention Native Son is on the same table, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, and then all of the debates about, uh, you know, the reason I go through all those uh, moments is because that's what the previous scholars did. You know, mm -hmm. David Leeming and his interview with, uh, uh, with uh, Baldwin and uh, Charles Newman and Lyle Powers, you know, great scholars of James. Uh, David uh, uh, Leeming was uh, uh, Edel's uh, graduate assistant, <laughs> you know, when he had that job with Baldwin. Like, you know, wouldn't that be cool if any of us could have gotten that kind of extra position <laughs> while we were working for the great biographer of James? Hey, Baldwin says, uh, you know, organize, organize my papers over here. I mean, what a, what a deal. But I mean, they're all great James scholars, but what do they do? They go in and they say, you know, Baldwin is deeply influenced by Henry James. More complicated arguments than that, but they just accept the old guy influenced the young guy. And I was trying to undo that because it doesn't make very much sense. You know, uh, uh, gay people or hetero people in New York City, or it's taking place in France, that episode, but they're not reading Wings of the Dove. You know, they could care less in the post-World War II period. It's all scholars at Columbia, you know, <laughs> having debates about Wings of the Dove, not ordinary people smoking cigarettes and having uh, every possible sexual and aesthetic experience imaginable. And so, uh, you know, it, uh, Baldwin really wakes you up with that kind of an illusion. And the scholars are there, you know, poking away at it saying, well, yes, and Wings of the Dove, this happened. And it just is very boring, let's say, and not very, uh, it, it's counterintuitive. Uh, and so I like this idea that Baldwin pulls from James modernist complexity of language to deal with issues that can't easily be represented. Uh, but he, 
what's not easily represented is something more uh, different than James ever represented. Yeah, yeah. I should say, John, I just love your um, um, uh, your model of literary influence here as, you know, to be influenced for Baldwin to be influenced by James, you know, it's not a matter of imitation. It's not even a matter of rejection. It's not a matter of, in a Bloomian sense, trying to outdo James. It's more like J the James as a ghost figure for uh, for Baldwin. I think that's a really brilliant ending for your book, um, and um, and really interesting model of literary influence. So. Thank you, David. I'm not supposed to call on people, but I think Paul, my old friend, is right next to me in the in the Hollywood Square, says his hand up. So I'd love to acknowledge him if I can, Melissa. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Great to see you again. And uh, yeah. the reaction I have, the question I have actually um, is inspired by the conversation you've been having with Beverly and with David about Baldwin. Um, and that's made me rethink some of the conversations I've had with you over the years about why and how one asks political questions of James and um, how one does history. And you may remember that back in Rome, many, many years ago, after your brilliant plenary there, I said, why do you want to give James a grudging B plus for his politics? Why, <laughs> why, why, why does it matter that uh, he's not as woke, which is the 21st century term we would use, as we are? Yeah. And that was because of my sense is that what matters is how James continues to speak to us and matter to us. And... Um, I, I think that the kind of uh, uh, analysis that you've been describing of Baldwin's um, uh, interaction with James shows a very different and much more productive sense of how we would interact with um, the, um, the constraints of people in the past, like James, to be able to understand things that we understand things differently and avoiding the hubris of critique, avoiding the presumption that we know better. Um, and one of the things I've admired about your work right from the very beginning is your sense of wanting to put things in dialogue with each other and the, the play of interaction between things that uh, 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 people might not have wanted to put next to James. I remember the struggles we both had as uh, young scholars trying to uh, get the new critics to think about, well, you could think about James and deconstruction. You think about James and phenomenology. You could think about James and Marx. Um, and to think that um, uh, the goal of pointing out the ambivalences in James and what he can't think about is to make him human in a way that opens him up for conversation with us where we can engage with him in ways that speaks not just only to, you know, speaks to the future, this whole notion of influence being how we can continue to talk with James and find James inspiring about things that matter to him is a way in which uh, shows that James is uh, benefits not by being thought of as the master we were taught in graduate school who could do no wrong, but where he does wrong, where he falls, where he slips, as we all do, being mortal, as you and I in our upper, <laughs> in our age now can particularly appreciate. That mortality allows him to speak to the future, to speak to us. And that seems to me to be what you were doing now with Baldwin in a way that I, uh, I really appreciate. And I think as David is saying, suggests a different model of influence, a different model of history, a different way in which one does critique the hermeneutics of suspicion in order to point beyond, to point ahead, to point beyond in a way that I think is generative and productive. And I just would like to hear your reaction to that. Well, I'm very pleased, Paul, that uh, I, I won't say anything about my uh, youth or back in Rome, uh, except to say perhaps I was uh, over-determining, over uh, stressing my own particular approach to that topic, but the fact that you uh, uh, understand clearly that what I'm trying to do is to, at the present moment, uh, deal with not just James, but other writers and intellectuals and artists who are messed up, just like I am, <laughs> you know, and, and the way that they messed up, so what do you do with that? Do you teach your students, oh, go ahead and make mistakes, <laughs> it's okay, what, how do you then contextualize those mistakes or confusions or unstrategic ambiguities? What comes after that? Who then responds? 
is it all somebody trying to fix up Shakespeare or Joyce or Jane Austen or Henry James later so that students will say, well, yeah, they're pretty good writers. I love them. You know, they they didn't really have they speak to universal truths or they were they didn't know what to do with, uh, you know, a different a changing gender and sexuality uh, with changing uh, racial attitudes. And they they were great writers or great intellectuals, but here's where they hit the wall, you know, and now let's us try to figure out, hey, what's a way beyond that, that, that impasse. Uh, I think it's uh, humbling to us. And uh, I don't think it diminishes the writers of the past, as you've been saying, it makes them more interesting because they're still engaging with stuff that you don't have at answers to. Uh, so Dennis is there. I haven't seen Dennis. I heard you and, uh, uh, and Nina are retired. Are you retired in Berkeley or did you move to Berkeley? We are, we are retired. Yes. We're living in Richmond, just up the hills a little bit from, uh, from Berkeley. Yeah. And I couldn't pass it. You know, somebody sent me the link to this. And I couldn't pass it the chance to <laughs> go back and recreate one of those old days. So I'll ask you a question. So I'm thinking it's, I don't think it's the same question that Paul was, was asking, but I'm thinking about the ways in which Henry James just, you know, gets it wrong, but gets it wrong in ways that, I, that, I think we all love. So in the <laughs> preface to what Maisie knew, he talks about Maisie having, and uh, I didn't prepare for this at all, so I've got back into the memory files for this. He says Maisie had feelings that, feelings or senses that she didn't have language for. And I always thought that's exactly wrong. Just read the book. She has words for things she has no feelings for. It takes her a long time to, to come to this. And that seems to me that it might be a way of thinking about relationship to contemporary culture that could be really productive because in, in a time where people are right now so intent on giving things their right names and we we are fighting over giving things their right names i frequently have the feeling that people have many more words than they have any sense of what is going on there's there's they have not figured out what it is that they're talking about but the language is all there so that you know, in the same way that Maisie could talk about all kinds of things that she had no idea what was actually going on in her, in her mind at that time, and I wonder if that is a is a way of of you know taking this kind of you know Jamesian ambiguity, and applying it very much to a contemporary sort of cultural situation. Yeah, I I think that's a brilliant uh, uh, response, uh, Dennis. Uh, I think of how, I mean, I, again, I was very cautious in this book not to make categorical judgments of, you know, James's What Maisie Knew is better than the 2014 film. But at least in that case, I did make the judgment because uh, the film is so reductive. It treats this child, the Maisie in the McGee uh, film, as if she's just She's got no resources whatsoever. She doesn't change. It's all about the adults. But in the novel, it really is about Maisie at not having the affective, emotive apparatus that you'd get from really being introduced to society properly. The parents are so careless with her. But she's got all kinds of words to toss around. And... Uh, She's a really interesting character in that regard. And by the way, if we had time, uh, she's really interesting in terms of her sexuality in the novel, even though I say James often yeah. finesses uh, sexual stuff. But I think in what Maisie knew, he really engages with her acquisition of a sexual identity, which is completely messed up and confused by these nutty parents. So, uh, you know, the novel is quite remarkable in that regard and shows you how bad some of the movies can be when they don't get the complexity that James put into it. Uh, I find something similar in The Awkward Age in uh, Chapter 3, in which I try to read The Awkward Age as an early soap opera, which I think it is. But uh, The uh, Awkward Age is where all people can do is talk. You know, they've just got words galore. But it's all to cover up the fact that they don't know how to express their feelings. And so in part because of changing social circumstances, economic circumstances in England and in the West, 
but uh, all they do is talk. I actually use as an epigraph to that uh, chapter my favorite uh, quotation from uh, uh, from Raymond Cano's Zazi Don La Metro in 1960, in which the parrot in a local bar keeps yeah. repeating over and over again, you know, talk, talk, talk. That's all you can do. Now, <laughs> somebody comes up to get a new drink and the parrot says the same thing again. But that's a 450 page novel and nobody does anything except talk to cover up the fact of their amorous inclinations, their messed up uh, economy, uh, you know, uh, their messed up politics and so forth and so on. And I think James is kind of brilliant at doing that. You know, saying you got a lot of words, but your feelings are, you know, they're out of whack. You don't know how to control these. You have no emotions that you are under control of. So great observation and great to see you. And back to the old deconstructive days of Irvine, where we had debates about this. Okay. There's I'll Gene. I'll call you next time we're in, we're in that way. Th thanks, John, so much. Um, for the sake of time, um, Jean, I'm going to let you ask your question, and then um, if it's okay with everyone, um, I'd like to tack my question on to Jean's. Yeah. Uh, Jean, I think you're muted still. She might be frozen. She looks, image looks like she might be frozen. Jean, oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this this point it's not a question it's kind of a point that connects to what Dennis just said. I noticed when you were talking about ambiguity that I didn't hear what I think is the main ambiguity in in James especially in, in Daisy Miller and that is you never know what she's really thinking. You don't know what she knows. And I think what's such a paradox about James is he's he's spilling out floods of words. But he can't he so often can't seem to get where he wants to go. And some of it's deliberate. And some of it is, um, you know, that he wants to leave this ambiguous. He, do, he doesn't want us to know what Daisy is up to. But I'm just reading and kind of review James's first novel, Watch and Ward. And there's so much, there's a flood of talk. I mean, this is such a botch, this novel. <laughs> That that and it's it's James trying out his method, and the method isn't yet working, and there's a you know more than a flood of character description, and you just think oh god enough just break off here. But anyway, my main point was I think that's the ambiguity is is that that you know that he both that he doesn't really want us to know because it's more interesting if we don't know. Well, it often serves. I think that's a good observation, uh, Gene. That. Uh... Uh, especially in works like Daisy Miller, and uh, John, I'm you know, so sorry, uh, John. I'm sorry. I'm so yes. sorry. I do want to make sure that Melissa gets to ask her question because oh. we have only a few minutes. Oh yeah, please, please. I'll just take that on. as a comment. Thank, Thank you, you, Danielle. And my question is also about Daisy Miller, so I think um, that it's a nice segue. Um, so I'm an early '80s baby, and my entry to Henry James, um, as you know, John, was through Merchant Ivory Films. <laughs> and I was so impressed by the aesthetics and the historical details and whatnot that I um, I didn't really gain an appreciation for some of the um, gendered and political problems surrounding um, the representation of the American girl. So um, my question is um, a pedagogical question, mostly. Well, you know, um, I'm wondering um, that in an era that uh, we're all in, one of uh, cancel culture, and um, Me Too, what ultimately are we to do with uh, Daisy Miller, both the original text and Bogdanovich's film, um, which I love and I don't want to give up, even though I can see now, thanks to your brilliant reading, that um, it is rather problematic. Um, so what value does Daisy Miller hold for students today? I think I'll, I'll answer this quickly because we've got to leave 30 seconds for Daniela, and, uh, you know, as professors, we tend to go on too long. I think the answer is that from James to Bogdanovich, you can see structural sexism uh, develop. Uh, whether it's developing or it's repeating itself, it's there. And so if you think about Daisy Miller, who uh, keeps 
Daisy in a box, so to speak. It's not just Winterborn. It's not just Giovanelli. It's also the high society women. Similarly, in uh, you know Bogdanovich's uh, uh, career, it's it's not just Bogdanovich being a, a having a puerile preference for ingenues, as Teresa Carpenter famously said in her Village Voice piece about the uh, murder and uh, you know tragic end of uh, Dorothy uh, Dorothy Stratton, uh, but it was also that he was assisted by folks like Hugh Hefner, obviously a sexist, but somebody who in the period was coming across as a big feminist. You know, I'm on for the, you know, opening up of the sexual boundaries and so forth and so on. It was structural sexism. And I think uh, my argument in that chapter is that James is part of it. Much as he's loved by, you know, feminist readers, uh, because he gives you liberated, emancipated uh, feminine characters. Uh, Isabel Archer is the famous one, Daisy Miller a little bit, uh, in his career. But he contributes to a kind of structural sexism in which uh, he also helps us see it, that uh, maybe the novel in its bourgeois forms represents. Because it's so often, especially in the 19th and early 20th century, about romance, uh, about reproduction of society about transmission of wealth and everything uh, else. I think the Me Too women, uh, movement would say, it's not Harvey Weinstein, it's the Hollywood apparatus that did it. So you can sue him and send him to prison. Uh, it's not gonna change the situation. There's gonna be another Hugh Hefner or Bog Bogdanovich out there. You know? I'm gonna stop there. Thank you all. I'm so grateful uh, to you being here and to seeing so many old friends and having such a great community over the years through Henry James. Well, what thank you. For me. Thank you so much, John, for writing the book that brought us all together. Uh, our Henry James in fiction, film, and popular culture. If you haven't already read it, I think this conversation makes clear why you need to go and do that right now. Thank you so much to uh, Beverly Haviland and David McWhorter for their uh, questions and comments and to Melissa Daniels Rotorcus for moderating the conversation. Thank you all for joining us today for Eleven Institute Book Chat. And um, we will have our, we have three more this semester. The next one is Professor Olivia Harrison's new book, Natives Against Nativism, Anti-Racism and Indigenous Critique in Post-Colonial France on October 27. So uh, the link is there if you care to join us. Many congratulations, John, on your book. And thank you once again to everyone present.